So in this video, I want to talk briefly about dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So let's first start with dementia and just talk about exactly what it actually is. Dementia is an umbrella term that we use for progressive neurodegenerative diseases associated with impaired cortical function. Okay, so think about the cortex of the brain. Think about the functions associated with the cortex, whether that be sensory or motor. So impaired cortical function and also impaired cognitive skills. So these cognitive skills could be language. These could be numeracy. They could potentially be motor. And they could also be uh, those associated with memory. So this is a very brief uh, description or classification of dementia. Now, there's many different types of dementia, okay? So you can have vascular dementia, and that's associated with arteriosclerosis. You could have infection-induced dementia, toxin-induced dementia. You can have genetic causes of dementia. And you can have the most common type of dementia, which is called Alzheimer's disease. So 50% of dementia patients or dementia cases are Alzheimer's disease, okay? So... Alzheimer's disease is the most common neurodegenerative disease in the world, okay? The second most common is Parkinson's disease, but the most common, Alzheimer's disease. It's so common that 10% of people aged over 65 years have Alzheimer's disease. So let's talk about Alzheimer's specifically. So Alzheimer's, like dementia, when we're speaking about the classification of dementia, is a progressive neurodegenerative disease associated with impaired cortical function and impaired cognitive skills. But in Alzheimer's disease, this is associated with neuronal loss, okay? So you actually have dying off or atrophy of these neurons, and overall this results in a smaller brain, okay? So you have reduced neuronal mass. I want to demonstrate this to you with a very quick drawing. If I want to draw up a, a healthy brain, so somebody without Alzheimer's, What you'll find is, and now this is a coronal section or a frontal section, and we're looking into the brain. You have some ventricles. So you have your lateral ventricles. Remember, ventricles are sort of spaces in the brain. They're important for a number of reasons, one of which is because they create cerebral spinal fluid. So you have a superior aspect of your lateral ventricles. Down here, you also have a very important part of your brain called the hippocampus. And your hippocampus sort of sits within the inferior aspect, snugly within the inferior aspect of your lateral ventricle. Because that's the superior aspect of your lateral ventricle. This is your inferior aspect of your lateral ventricle. Okay, now, what does that mean? How does that work? Well, the lateral ventricle comes out like this. It comes out. And so that's why the superior aspect, then it curves back around, and that's the inferior aspect of your lateral ventricle. Now, in addition to that, you have your gyri and sulci of your cortex. Remember the lumps and bumps of your brain? Gyri, gyrus is a bump up, a sulcus is a dip down, okay? So if I were to draw this gyri, sulci of the brain, you'd see that the sulci, which are the dips, are actually quietly, quite tightly packed between each other, okay? So you can see it's quite packed. Now this is, like I said, a healthy individual. And in addition to that, we need to draw the cortex. Remember the cortex is the thin outer layer of the cerebrum. And the cortex, depending on where you're looking at, can either be associated with motor or sensory function. So what you can see here, what we've drawn up, is a couple of different important points that I'd like to highlight. So, for example, you have ventricles. So this is a healthy brain. You have ventricles, which are of a particular size. Okay. You have hippocampus or hippocampi. Hippocampus. Now hippocampus to a number of different functions, one of which is, I'll write down here, short-term memory storage. Okay? You also have your cortex. 
cerebral cortex. Okay? Healthy brain. Now, if we look at the brain of a patient with Alzheimer's disease, because I said you get cortical atrophy, so you get a reduction in brain size, the whole brain is actually smaller. So let's have a look. And you can actually see a diminished weight. If you weigh post-mortem the brains of an Alzheimer's patient, it's actually a lot lighter. So if we were to draw this brain up, You'll also see, apart from the brain being smaller, is that the sulci that dips down, there's actually a wider gap between each sulci. You'll also find that the ventricles are larger. And you'll also see that the hippocampus is reduced in size. And the ventricle, lateral, inferior aspect of the lateral ventricle is increased. Okay? So let's have a look at the sulci. I said the gaps between each one is larger. and you have reduced cortical mass. So this is what you'd see in a post-mortem brain or a brain scan of an individual with Alzheimer's disease. So let's have a look. You have reduced cortical neurons, or you could say cortical atrophy. You have atrophy of the hippocampus. You have increased ventricle size. And all of these are associated with the signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's. Reduced hippocampus size can be associated with reduced short-term memory storage. So a lot of these individuals have problems with storing short-term memories. Their long-term memory may be fine or unaltered. However, because it's a progressive degenerative disease, you'll find that spreads from hippocampus to more cortical regions of the brain, that the long-term memories begin to get altered. Okay. Now the question is, why does this happen? And the answer is we don't really know. We know there's some underlying genetic causes, and we know there's some underlying environmental causes, and predominantly you'll find it's going to be an interaction between the both. Some environmental causes mixed with genetic causes may produce the phenotype or the disease of Alzheimer's. Now, if we have a look at the pathology of the disease, you see a couple of important points. So one thing that you see, and I'm going to just remove this. One thing that you see is something called neurofibrillary tangles. Another thing that you see is what's called senile plaques. So let's talk about what these are. So if you were to have a look post-mortem, take some brain sample of an Alzheimer's patient, have a look at the brain, what you'll find is with neurons. So firstly, within a healthy neuron, healthy neurons want to send signals from the cell body down the axon to the synapse so it can release neurotransmitters. Okay, that's a healthy neuron. It doesn't just send action potentials. Okay, it needs to send proteins, it needs to send nutrients, it needs to send other important molecules either in that direction of the neuron or in that direction of the neuron. How does it do it? It doesn't do it just through electrical signals. There needs to be some sort of scaffold, some cytoskeleton, like an escalator that takes it back and forth, and there are. They're called microtubules. So neurons have these long, thin, protein-based structures which shuttle molecules back and forth. Okay? Microtubules. That's in a functioning neuron. But for some reason in Alzheimer's disease, these proteins, these microtubules become misfolded and tangled up. 
and therefore don't function properly. They can't shuttle molecules back and forth. And that's what's called neurofibrillary tangles. Okay? Senile plaques. What you'll find is in the cell wall, sorry, it's not a bacteria, in the cell membrane, in the plasma membrane of a neuron, you have a number of proteins. Okay? You've got heaps of proteins. Now, some of these proteins are important in appropriate synaptic function. Okay, so appropriate release of neurotransmitters, appropriate reuptake, and so forth. But some of these proteins in Alzheimer's disease misfold as well. They become dysfunctional and they get released into the extracellular fluid. And some of these proteins will come together and they'll form a large misfolded protein, which we call a senile plaque. So when you look down the microscope of patients with Alzheimer's disease, look at their brains, you'll see neurofibrillary tangles associated with dysfunctional misfolded microtubules, and you'll see senile plaques which are associated with again misfolded proteins within the plasma, from the plasma membrane out in the extracellular fluid. In addition to that, a lot of these patients, where well, Alzheimer's is associated with reduced levels of acetylcholine, so this neurotransmitter in the central nervous system is an excitatory neurotransmitter. So remember, it's excitatory. And acetylcholine is really important in laying down new neuronal um, functions, new neuronal synapses for laying down memories and all these types of functions. That's what acetylcholine neurons or cholinergic neurons, I should say, are associated with. And so we're not sure why this reduction takes place, but it gives us an opportunity to pharmacologically try and manage some of the signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. How do we manage that? Well, if we've got reduced acetylcholine, we want to increase it. Now, a way that we can increase it is by reducing the amount of enzyme that breaks it down. So there's an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. And acetylcholine esterase eats up acetylcholine. Okay? So, if we can give a patient an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, if we give a patient acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, well, that will stop this enzyme from breaking down acetylcholine. Okay, and therefore we'll have higher levels of acetylcholine in the system. Perfect. So that's one way we can, we can't cure Alzheimer's disease at the moment, and we can't really stop the neurodegenerative process, but if we can increase acetylcholine for as long as possible, then we can mitigate some of the symptoms of the disease. Now, there's another theory very quickly I want to talk about is, why does this occur? Well, there are some theories out there that it could be due to what's called glutamate excitotoxicity. What's that? Simple. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter in the central nervous system, and so is glutamate. I said acetylcholine is an excitatory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system, so is glutamate. How does glutamate work? Well, if we have a neuron, And we want that neuron to fire off an action potential starting here at the cell body and send it all the way down to release neurotransmitters. We need to excite it. So we can give it acetylcholine or we could give it glutamate and that will excite the action potential to come down. But how does it work? If glutamate comes down, they need to bind to glutamate receptors. Once this happens, how does an action potential get sent? Well, you know that inside a neuron is negative compared to outside. And all an action potential is, is a depolarization event propagating down the axon. That just means that positive ions, so cations, are rushing into the cell in a domino effect. That's all our signals are. Positive ions rushing in like this. So how does glutamate do this? Well, when glutamate binds to the receptors, it opens up specific channels. And one of these channels is a calcium channel. So glutamate will excite a neuron by opening up calcium channels. And you know calcium is one of those positive ions that sits outside the cell, and it rushes in. So if you bring positive calcium in, it will lead to a depolarization event, and then action potential will be sent. That's how glutamate works as an excitatory neurotransmitter.
But in Alzheimer's disease, we think that the patient may have uh, too much glutamate being released. Hence glutamate excito, because it's excitatory. Toxicity, because it's resulting in a toxic effect. So if too much glutamate binds to the neuron, then too much calcium is going to come into the cell. And why is this bad? Well, because too much cal when you have excessive amounts of calcium entering a cell, that usually results in cell death. Okay, So that's one theory, that these neurons of the brain, of the hippocampus, of the cortex, are starting to die off potentially due to glutamate excitotoxicity. Now, I haven't spoken about some of the stages of dementia and the stages of Alzheimer's disease. There are three major stages. I'm not going to go through that in this video because the video will be too long, but can you please go back for your lecture notes and have a look at the stages of dementia. Thanks.